I know a very famous person who shall remain unnamed who's publicly said he's never asked for forgiveness from anybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so there could be... <laughs> um, who could he be referring to? Hmm. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Welcome back to another Debate Teacher Reacts. It's Shaboy Nate Sala. I'm the president of Wise Disciple. We are a Christian nonprofit organization dedicated to giving you the tools you need to live effectively as Christians in today's culture. Now, I'm upset. All right, can I start the video off with a grievance? I'm upset because it is currently December the 2nd, and in Las Vegas right now, it's still like 75 degrees outside. Like, what the, what? Do I need to contact my local weatherman to voice my concerns? Like, I need my fireplace, my stockings, my hot chocolate. Vegas has not gotten the memo, okay? It's unbelievable. And speaking of unbelievable, what a great segue, Nate, thank you. Speaking of unbelievable, as of this recording, I just heard that William Lane Craig debated James White on Molinism. Yeah, okay, right? Pinch yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm not sure this is really happening. No, it is real, it did happen. And I, I guess I'm wondering then, next episode of Debate Teacher Reacts? All right, well, today's video is based on your votes, and you all told me that what you want to see is Trent Horn versus James White on the issue of eternal security. Now, you'll excuse me if I'm having deja vu here, but a couple of months ago, you all wanted to see me react to James White versus Leighton Flowers, and then... Uh... <laughs> Look what happened, right? A lot of folks got upset because their guy didn't win. But that's just how the cookie crumbles, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what to tell you. So before we get to the end of this video and your guy loses for some reason, and then you get mad and accuse me of being a Protestant or a Catholic or a communist or something, let me give you my criteria for this debate. All right, here it is for you. You ready? There are four categories that I'll be paying attention to. Number one, who is engaging with the topic better than the other? Okay, in other words, like who is answering the topic question in a more robust fashion? If I remember, this topic is framed in the form of a question. So who's going to answer the question more fully and efficiently? All right. Number two, who is laying a better framework? Now, I've said this before, but laying a framework is essentially narrating to the audience or the judges how to think through the issues and judge the debate. Now, obviously, a particular interlocutor will lay a framework in a manner that is more advantageous to their position, right? But nevertheless, that is vital to a debate in terms of strategy. I mean, a lot of times in debates, things get very technical, you know? Uh, folks in the audience can easily get lost in the weeds, particularly judges, all right? Sometimes judges in real tournaments, they're just parents or, or other adults who are stepping in because they're always looking for judges at tournaments, all right? And sometimes these judges don't have the technical background to follow all the arguments and evidence. And so more often than not, Whoever lays a better framework wins the debate. Even if they slip in some of these other categories, laying a framework is very important. By the way, if you want to see a very good example of laying a framework, take a look at Kevin Bacon's opening statement as the prosecutor in A Few Good Men. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. Number three, who is handling the word of God better than the other? I hope we can agree, both Catholic and Protestant, that a lot of the battle in this debate will come down to the scriptures. I mean, the Bible obviously is a source that both sides will not dispute. They'll both be appealing to this source, so it's it's going to come down to the, the opponent's interpretations of the scripture. Who is a better exegete? Who is handling the word better than the other? And number four, who is asking more challenging questions in cross-examination? In other words, who is providing more clash than the other guy? All right, so that's it. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list of things that I'll be looking at, but these are the big pieces of criteria that I'll be using to judge this particular debate. All right, you with me so far? Good, let's get right into it. Here we go, testing one, two, three. All right, we're Testing, working. party time. All right, uh, Mr. Horn, you said something in your rebuttal period that, if I understood it correctly, changes everything, and that's why it, it, it confused me. You said something along the lines, and I was writing as fast as I could, God wills to save all that he has chosen to persevere. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the gift of perseverance. Do you hold the position that there are people that God gives the gift of perseverance to who will 
never lose their salvation, but then there are other Christians who are truly born again, but he doesn't give them the gift of perseverance, and they may or may not make it. Is that the position you're taking? Uh, <clears throat> that's the position that I, that's why I cited uh, Augustine on that point. He talked about how perseverance to the end, there you could have two pious men or two regenerate, justified people, and one is given perseverance to the end and another has not. That ultimately, coming into union with Christ uh, is by the grace of God. So God can elect to give someone grace so that they come into faith, uh, so they come into the body of Christ, and he might give other people grace that will sustain them through all the way to the end. And some people, uh, I think I would say all people are given enough grace to come to know God because God desires the salvation of all people, but ultimately not everyone will be saved. And those who are saved do so because God has elected them to be saved to final salvation. Horn said some things here that are not articulate. Uh, and you know, he's in the hot seat, okay? He, he's in the hot seat in Crossfire, so he's doing his best. But if I understand what just happened, Horn appears to share White's position to a degree. That is, White's position is that uh, when God saves his elect, those individuals will not fall away because God saving them in election keeps them saved. But it sounds like Horn also takes this position. For, for some individuals, God will save them and ensure that they never fall away, but that's White's position. So why are they debating right now? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like they both agree. Maybe Horn can explain further here. What you just said there at the end confused me because so there are people. Someone could be elected to come to Christ, but not necessarily to stay with Christ. So he elects. Yes, but some could also be elected to come to Christ and stay with Christ and not fall away. That's what Horn just said. That's the only thing that makes sense of Jesus saying they fall away or Paul saying they're severed from Christ or they fell from grace. That the definition of a temporary believer would be someone who had grace and then fell from grace. It doesn't make sense to say you fall from grace if you never had it. It'd be like saying, you know, hey, don't mess around on the monkey bars, kid. You, you, you have fallen from the monkey bars. If that was a roundabout way of saying, well, he was never really on the monkey bars in the first place. But so, so there are elect people that are not elected to salvation. Yes, and we see these examples in Scripture, and John... Uh-oh, so White's losing the thread here. Uh, he had that thread, and now he's losing it. Let's see if he finds it again. 670, yeah. Jesus said, I chose the 12, or literally, I elected you 12, yet one of you is a devil. Jesus chose the 12, but Judas was not elected to final salvation. So all these other people are like the unique son of perdition. He's one example of someone who fell away, a very famous one, I will add, but... So you don't see anything special about being the son of perdition, the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures to function in a particular way? Well, I, there's something unique there, just as there's something unique when Peter accepted uh, Christ, you know, when, when Peter understood the revelation of God, there were other unique figures in scripture obviously they'll be you know there people have unique roles in salvation history so it sounds like horn takes the arminian position that god's saving grace is prevenient which means that it's available to all for the taking but with prevenient grace only those who repent and follow jesus actually respond in a meaningful sense and are saved everyone else rejects god's prevenient grace and are not saved but then in the category of those who repent and are saved it sounds like horn is saying that some of those in that category, God ensures will not fall away. And White needs to keep probing about that. The other thing is the phrase son of perdition, which refers to Judas, right? And also uh, the Antichrist, right? It's a Hebrew idiomatic expression, and it means the one who is destined for perdition. Like if you're the son of something, then that something is your destiny, which is a little strange because then it sounds like Horn is saying that all those who fall away were destined to fall away if they're all like Judas. So now we're back into that election territory again, which runs up against his position. But m maybe he'll explain. There are many nameless people who are elected to come to Christ and don't stay. Most of the scripture passages that I mentioned, it talks about nameless people who, who fall away. And Jesus warns nameless people, but real people who can fall away. So you believe in the eternal security of the elect who are given the gift of perseverance? To final salvation. To final salvation. Yeah, I mean, God, isn't that what I believe? Is that what you believe? 
<laughs> and there it is, right? Like, like Horn is arguing for the same thing that White is arguing for, except the difference is the number of people elected to salvation is smaller in Horn's view, I guess. But this is White's position. Those who are saved are elected to be saved, and they won't fall away. This is kind of a big deal, guys. Like, up until this point, Horn has been killing it. As a matter of fact, Horn did a great job in his opening and rebuttal statements, right? You should definitely go ahead and take a look at the full debate and take notes because this is how it should be done in terms of good debate on both sides, right? But when Horn agrees with White here, this means he's essentially undermining his own arguments against White's contention. Okay, think about that. The topic of the debate is entitled, Can a Christian Lose Their Salvation, right? Horn began his opening statement by saying the answer to this question is yes. But now it appears that he's saying the answer is yes and no. It's yes for some and no for others because for some people, God will save those whom he chose to persevere. Unless Horn has some very, like, very unique definitions for these words, he has undermined his own contentions. If I were white at this particular point, I would try to get Horn to like back up his statement about perseverance with some arguments and evidence, because ultimately, like whatever he says to support himself should undermine his own contentions. So let's see what happens. I believe that the elect who are given the gift of perseverance to final salvation will never fall away. I, the only, so the only difference between us is that I don't believe that God elects people, that he joins them with Christ, Christ dies on their behalf, all the rest of that stuff, and then he doesn't give them the gift of perseverance? Yeah, the difference, the difference, the difference between, between you and I is I believe God is sovereign, he can do as he pleases. Well, that's an interesting way of putting it, but that, that doesn't really answer the question, because uh, I, it, it, it sounds like you're, you are admitting that the will of man in the case of the elect who are given the gift of perseverance will not be able to undo uh, the decree of God in the final salvation of those individuals, right? Well, what you're saying is that when God wills something, it's necessarily going to come to pass. That is true in some cases that God wills the creation of the universe and here it is. But God can will other things, and I gave the example earlier that, for example, God certainly wills that no member of the elect sin, or at least an uncontroversial example would be commits a serious sin, like has an abortion or commits adultery. I, I think you and I would be clear, God doesn't desire anyone, especially a member of the elect, to do that, but they, they still do. So God can will for something to, to come to pass, uh, but it might not because well, he's willed to decree other things like we, man has free will. We, we, we can describe the prescriptive and, de uh, and descriptive will of God at, at another point, but uh, prescriptive will versus his decretive will. But it sounds like what you're saying is that in the case of the elect that God gives the gift of perseverance to, that man's will cannot undo what God chooses to do, that they will be saved in, in finality and that is all due to God's sovereign decree, right? No, that's not the way that I put it. You and I have very different views about God's sovereignty. You okay, uh, all right. So now we're getting to the heart of the matter, okay? This is where he's going to hopefully clarify his points of disagreement, all right? You hold that God is sovereign, and this is a topic for another debate. We're talking about the perseverance of the saints. You're espousing the idea of God's sovereignty being that he's foreordaining things, that he's you know, actively willing or causing these things to happen. In my point of view, it makes sense. If God creates human beings, he will perfectly foreknow who will choose to love him, who will choose to remain with him, and he gives those people grace to persevere to the end. He's not under any obligation to give uh, other people any certain amount of grace, including letting them come to Christ or letting them fall away. There's no failure in God's will on this part. Why would he so it sounds like what Horn meant to say, and he used slippery language to get there. All right. Which, which by the way, I'm not above framing issues in advantageous ways myself. OK, um, every good debater does that to a, to a degree. But it sounds like Horn meant that God foreknows who will persevere and then chooses to give some kind of special grace to final salvation. Uh, to those individuals. If that's what he's saying, then the next question is, why do these individuals need this kind of special grace if they were already going to persevere? So let's see what happens. Why would he give a grace 
the grace of perseverance to people that he already foreknows are going to persevere. There it is. Because the reason that they persevere is because God, get, you know, everything that we do, as I said before, what Augustine says, he who stands, stands by God. He who, for, you know, he who falls, falls of his own will. Uh, I think it would just say that anything we do coming to God, uh, for example, our initial salvation is by grace alone. We don't merit it with works or faith or anything like that. That is by grace. And so God gives different amounts of grace to different people. And he has the authority to do that. Freely? God does. Freely? Is there, is there anything in the, in the, in the creature that, that determines this? Well, there may be something in the creature that God foreknows who will love him, but that would go to another question about whether election is conditional or unconditional, but I, I didn't really hear an argument tonight to say that election is, is, is unconditional. So that's a clever shift, okay? But the bottom line is, Horn has not answered the question. Why do these individuals who God foreknew would persevere need special grace? Uh, let's see what happens next here. If you're given the gift of perseverance, you're going to be saved no matter anything else. Is that true or false? If you're giving the... If, if, you, if God gives you the gift of perseverance, you will be saved. If it's the pers gift of perseverance to final salvation. But uh, the point is, I'm saying not every Christian. What we disagree about is which members of the elect may receive this grace and what is the reason they receive this grace. Because the reason may be God knows who will freely respond uh, in different ways to, to enter into a relation with him. But I, I guess that I want to back up a little bit, though. I'm not saying that, that people are able to, to freely resist God's grace, that if they're going to be what is sustaining them to the end of their life, what is sustaining them so that they remain uh, with Christ is going to be God's grace, but that grace isn't irresistible. So man can still man can freely choose to resist it. There will just be some people who choose to not resist it and die unrepentant. But is the grace of perseverance resistible? Because you said that if a person's given the gift of <laughs> This is hard to watch. Uh, okay. If Horn is your guy, step outside your body for a moment and evaluate his performance. He's talking very ambiguously out of both sides of his mouth. And I'm not having a laugh, okay? I mean, this is really hard to do, all right? Uh, withstanding cross-examination is very difficult. Uh, and, and I anticipate that, you know, White is going to flounder when Horn gets his turn at him. You know what I mean? But right now, Horn is in the hot seat, and he, he's not doing well. Is that gift yes, but of that, perseverance that, that, that resistible? Gift, that gift may be given to people who, because they love God and will continue to love God, won't resist. But here's the thing. Just because they won't fall away from God later, they won't resist God, they still need grace at the beginning of their life onward to continue in the Christian life, to continue to grow in righteousness. They, I know that you've been really, you're upset about no, synergism. I'm not being upset. I'm just completely lost as to why would God need to give a gift of perseverance to those whom he foreknows are, are going to freely continue to choose to love him. Mm -hmm. Well, it because sounds, it because sounds like it's given based on what they do. The reason they love him is because they continue to receive the grace he gives him. They don't reject it. If the grace is not there, they are incapable of loving God, just as if there's no gasoline in the tank of the car, the car won't go anywhere, even though the person can push the gas or the brake. So God foreknows that some people will persevere if and only if he bestows upon them special grace. All right? And then, based on that foreknowledge of certain individuals... He gives it to those people. Well, if that's what's going on here, the problem with that is Horn doesn't solve the original issue. The original issue was, can a Christian lose their salvation? And according to Horn now, the answer is, well, for some folks, no, because if God provides special grace based on his foreknowledge, then and only then will these folks persevere. If he does not provide this special grace, they will not persevere. So this stance he's taken has gotten him stuck right in the mud. And I, I just do not see a way out for him. I'd say right now, clear advantage to James White. I mean, Horn is really handling himself well, like in terms of presentation, but he's got to know that he's not doing well here at the moment. Trying to understand, because it sounds like what you're saying is that in the case of some people, God is actually able to save them by giving them the gift of perseverance. But it sounds like you're saying he only gives that gift of perseverance to people that he foresees 
are going to continue to love him, which is what perseverance is. So he gives them the gift of what he foresees they're going to do anyways. He understands how they'll respond to that gift. And so God will give his grace in different ways. I think ultimately the, the disagreement we're having here, and I'll finish my question, is you, you've put forward a very strong presentation saying, it is God alone who saves, man is not involved in any way, but I haven't really heard a lot of evidence to the contrary. Whereas if you read in scripture, especially the passages I talk about, about where people can fall away from the faith, I think it's very clear that God sustains us from beginning to end in our salvation. People can resist. Some people will not. God knows that they will, will love him, but their love on its own is not enough to enter into the kingdom. Their love has to freely receive that grace God gives them, some to initial salvation and some to final. Uh, you, you talked about mortal and venial sin as being, as being a defect in the, the Catholic view of mm -hmm. soteriology and justification. But it seems to me you agree that uh, if someone claims to be a Christian but commits a big sin, apostasy would be an example, unrepentant apostasy, that would prove that they were a false professor. Well, I, I don't think it's a matter of big sin versus small sin. The sin of apostasy, specifically trampling underfoot the blood of the Son of God, which is also the sin in view in, in 1 John when it talks about the sin and death, um, that is the key issue, well, okay, and it's well, something well, that a true believer Well, not just apostasy. Do. Let's say, for example, a member of your church uh, left. Uh, let's say it was someone who has homosexual attractions, and he's lived a celibate life, but then is deceived by somebody like Matthew Vines and thinks, I can be a faithful Christian and a homosexual and engage, lives a homosexual lifestyle till the end of his days. In your view, would that show that person was a false professor? From our perspective, yes, it would. But I can't, that, that, look, I'm not going to claim to be able but to look I, into I, someone's I, heart, but I'm, going to, but I'm going to say from the church's perspective that that person would be put out as an unrepentant sinner, yes. It's, and, but, okay. Um, do people have to repent of, of all of their sins? Because, for example, let's say there's someone who lives in a homosexual relationship their whole life. Uh, James 3.2 says we all stumble in many ways. So a member of the elect who, who gossips frequently and, and never repents of the, the calumny they talk about others, would, would that person turn out to be a false professor? Well, again, the, the, the question is not are there false professors in the church, which I believe that there are, uh, and that's why we try to proclaim the whole counsel of God in the church so that you bring to bear the condemnation of gossiping, for example, and trust the Holy Spirit of God will bring conviction of that. The, the question is, if a person is truly in Jesus Christ, how do they have peace with God, and what do the passages in Scripture instruct them as to how they are to live in light of the peace that they have with God? Mm -hmm. So a person who would be uh, the, the, the gossip uh, should be a person who is brought, it's brought to their attention that that is sinful in God's sight and they're displeasing him. And what if they don't repent of that? Well, I, I've never encountered someone who when faced with that particular, uh, uh, you know, when brought before the elders or people that they well, know and I'll love. I'll give you another example, forgiveness. You, you said I said that Jesus required us to perfectly forgive. The word perfect's not in the verse that I, no, that I cited. It, it, he says, if you, he just says, if you don't forgive your brother, I know a very famous person who shall remain unnamed who's publicly said he's never asked for forgiveness from anybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so there could be... <laughs> um, who could he be referring to? Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's right. So this is an interesting strategy, and you can classify this line of questioning under test of coherence or something. In other words, how does your system work internally and are there any inconsistencies when held up to scripture? I think I would be spending more time on exegesis proper, but this is definitely a path to explore with your interlocutor. You know, Jesus does appear to say, if you do not forgive others, your heavenly father will not forgive you. He doesn't appear to say it. That's exactly what he says in uh, in Matthew chapter 6. So let's see what White does with this line of questioning. You just lost your 501c3, by the way, just just so you know. <laughs> no, who, who, who is the unforgiving man <laughs> in, Trent's, in Trent's question? But it, it just seems to me that if... Is this if being live streamed? Did someone see that? <laughs> <laughs> if members... It, the, the point here is that if members of the elect, it seems to me, they won't go on committing 
you know, living a homosexual lifestyle, but they will stumble in small ways. Yes. The, the, so, but isn't the, look, there, a, if, isn't, if what's the difference between a sin like homosexuality and stumbling in small ways? How's that it's not a like willingness to be cor- it's, it's a willingness to be corrected and to allow the Word of God to speak. If a person, if, if I go to a person in my congregation who's gossiping and they're bringing, they're bringing condemnation to others and they're bringing division, and they go, well, I don't think the Word of God actually says that, or I'm not really under the authority of that. That's the same thing as a, as a person who would buy into Matthew Vine's arguments as well. It may be what we would call a lesser sin, but it's the willingness to hear the voice of Christ. Jesus says, my voice, my, my sheep hear my voice. There is going to be a willingness to be corrected by the Word of God. That's what is going to be okay. seen in the lives of the elect. Well, let's look at the, the warning passages then. Yes. And I know you wanted to talk about Hebrews. I would enjoy talking about um, Hebrews as well. So in Hebrews 10, 28, 29, it says that there's a severe punishment for someone who breaks the new covenant. How much severe punishment will be deserved who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? Who's the he? That's right. In your book, The Potter's Freedom, on page 245, you say the he who is sanctified by the blood of the covenant is Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. Um, Hebrews 9, 12 through 14, Hebrews 13, say that the blood of Christ purifies and sanctifies believers. Wouldn't an ordinary person take Hebrews 10, 29? Okay, so here we go, right? The, these are the exegesis questions that I was looking for. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to the previous line of questioning, but now we get into the exegesis, so let's go. Uh, Hebrews, by the way, um, as you follow along, it would be crucial for you to open up your scripture and read along uh, with the passages so that you can track a lot of this stuff. Hebrews, to have that same category that the blood of the Son of God is purifying and sanctifying a believer, not Jesus Christ. Well, wouldn't, first of all, wouldn't an ordinary no, person? No. You're saying an ordinary person wouldn't come to that conclusion? No, they would not. Is your view the minority view on this passage? It, it may be, but the, the fact of the matter is the book of so Hebrews... You, so you're a very extraordinary person. No, what I'm saying is the book of Hebrews is very often misinterpreted because people don't know the Old Testament. If you don't understand the book of Leviticus, the book of Hebrews is going to be a closed book to you. Mm-hmm. If you don't understand what happened on the day of Yom Kippur, the book of Hebrews will be a closed book to you. Mm-hmm. And as a result, church history has demonstrated, especially after Origen, the allegorical interpretation of methodology became popular, that the book of Hebrews was absolutely tortured as to its real meaning. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14 had already talked about the perfection of the individual for whom Christ had died. If you knew what the high priest did, then you would know that before the offering on Yom Kippur, it's actually not Yom Kippur, it's Yom Kippurim. It's multiple atonements. And before the offering for the people was made, the high priest had to give an offering for himself. And that when he brings that blood in, there is the sanctification of the high priest himself. why, Why does he bring the offering for himself? Because, because he himself is taking the position, before he can bring the blood of the people in, there has to be cleansing of everything in the, in the entirety of the tabernacle. Does, the Jesus, the, does Jesus, the new high priest, have to be cleansed? Jesus, what did, what did he do with John the Baptist? He was baptized by John the Baptist, right? And John said, no, I should be baptized by you. What does Jesus say? Suffer so to be so now, for thus it fulfills all righteousness. Are, are you saying so the Jesus ba- follows... Are you saying the baptism of Jesus cleansed him in the same no, way that... No, I'm saying that he obeyed the law. For example, in Luke 2.22, it is said that the offering for sin was made for he and his mother, just as the, com- the command was made. There was no sin in him, but they were following the law. In the same way, the high priest, he sanctifies the offering by the present- presentation of himself. Are you saying the high- that Jesus in his offering... So Horn is trying to pin white on his interpretation of Hebrews chapter 10, Okay. The problem is, and yet you have to know your scriptures here, okay? But Hebrews chapter 10, in terms of interpretation, can cut both ways. That's, that's why Christians have disagreed about this for a while, okay? At face value, if you isolate this verse without looking around at the context, then you'll probably agree with Horn that a Christian who is being sanctified can lose their salvation. But if you start looking around... And you notice that, you know, I mean, White pointed it out, you know, then verse 10, it says that Christ's sacrifice has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, then you'll probably tend to agree with White. So this isn't really a slam dunk. It, it's basically a wash at this point. Did not sanctify himself? What I'm saying is that the blood, that whenever scripture refers to the blood of Christ sanctifying, 
when it says the blood of Christ sanctifies, it always refers to sanctifying believers. And you said, well, a lot of people don't understand the Old Testament. Um, Thomas Schreiner is a Reformed theologian like you. He holds eternal security. Schreiner probably understands the Old Testament. Would you? Right? Certainly. Okay. Well, this is what he says in his commentary on Hebrews. He says, it is awkward and unnatural to see a reference to Jesus in the pronoun instead of believers, for it makes little sense to say Jesus was sanctified by his own blood. Jesus is the one who sanctifies in Hebrews 2.11, not the one who is sanctified. So my last question on this point is just this. If biblical scholars and ordinary, wouldn't an ordinary person then, when they read this passage, why is it you think that, that people come to this conclusion that it's the believer? Doesn't it seem to me that the only reason we have to say that it's Jesus is because we can't have a true believer punished with eternal death? Because the blood of the covenant is what is under... So Horn is pointing out that White runs up against the likes of Thomas Schreiner, who I, I have some of Schreiner's commentaries. I mean, he's got an excellent mind. Horn even gets White to agree that Schreiner is knowledgeable about the Old Testament, and now Schreiner disagrees with White on his interpretation of Hebrews. This was really good uh, for Horn. This helps him out. At this point, though, I would not be talking about ordinary people and interpretations, because then it kind of allows White to reiterate his interpretation of Hebrews, because White is knowledgeable of the scriptures. Here, I would be driving home the point that White disagrees with other well-known scholars, um, or a majority of scholars, and let that dig into his credibility there, and then move on to another question. It is the seriousness of what this person has done, and notice what it says, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. This is the same covenant that only a few verses earlier perfects those, and by one offering makes them complete. The author is not going to, in a matter of only 14 verses, turn around and completely contradict what he had just said as the evidence of his argument against the repetitive sacrifices of the Old Covenant. You're making the writer of the Hebrews contradict how, himself. How am I making him do that when he's simply saying that those who violate the New Covenant have a severe punishment? They have regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. So I guess we're going to have to... Well, you say it's a, it's a perfect sacrifice, but Hebrews 10.26 says if someone deliberately sins, it no longer remains. Well, I just think you need to read uh, what anyone writes. Like if I, if I read your book, I would allow what you write in paragraph A to determine what comes afterwards. And since Hebrews 10, 10 through 14 comes before Hebrews 10, 28 to 29, I think we need to read it in order, not backwards. I've, I've read it in order. It's not the parts I don't understand. It's the parts I do understand that why concern are you holding, me. Why are you holding Because it's your book? interpretation of Hebrews that's incorrect. So Horn has gotten in some blows here uh, with White, and that's good for Horn. Uh, I, do, I don't know if Horn has overcome White's lead when it comes to what happened in previous cross-examination. So let's see what happens next. I'd like to get to some other texts as, as well here. I have so many uh, of these written down. Let's do it. Um, I, I, I completely lost what you were saying in Romans chapter 4, if we could go back to what you were saying about, you said that Romans chapter 4 is about anyone who receives forgiveness of sins. Is that a, what you said? A, apart from the Mosaic law. Blessed is the man whose sins God forgives. That's, that's the point that Paul is making here. So when you look at verse 6, just as David also speaks, the blessing of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, you interpret works to be merely the Mosaic law. I, I, what is the question? Romans 4, 6. <clears throat> Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God imputes or credits righteousness apart from works, then that's the introduction to uh, Romans 4, 7, and 8, the citation from Psalm 32. Mm -hmm. So you just said something about the Mosaic law. So are you interpreting works as solely the Mosaic law? I'm saying that's one way that the verse can be interpreted. I'll take two points to this. Number one, even if one interpreted this broadly and came to the conclusion of justification by faith alone, as I said earlier, that doesn't entail eternal security. Because one could say, you are justified, your sins won't be credited to you because you simply have faith in God. But if faith leaves, then God, because He's sovereign, He could decree you're forgiven, then decree you're unforgiven, just as He does in the parable of the unmerciful servant. 
Uh, second, yeah, I would say that it, it makes the most sense to say, Paul is talking about, as he does, righteousness apart from works of the Mosaic law, that in order to be justified, you don't have to, in the controversy in the church, you don't have to become a Jew before you become a Christian. And the great clue to that is after verse 8, it says, is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? So you could look at it either way, but in either case, you don't get the doctrine of eternal security. In Roman Catholic theology, if you commit a mortal sin, is it imputed to you? Is it imputed? It destroys charity in the, the heart of man. But so it is imputed to your account. You are held accountable for it. Yeah, ju just, just as when I've said in these other verses that if someone in 1 Corinthians 6, if they commit these other mortal sins, adultery, homosexuality, things like this, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. But blessed is the man who does this, who seeks forgiveness from God, for if he does that, his sins will not be taken into account. <laughs> so the reason I'm quiet at this point is because this is what it looks like when you have two... Uh, interlocutors who are pretty closely matched and they are they are doing their job you know what I mean like this is this is good uh, from both sides I'm trying to like think like could you say or do anything differently representing both positions I don't think you can these guys are these guys are representing their positions really well so I'm just I'm, <laughs> I'm taking it in just like you are so if you commit a mortal sin or a venial sin it is imputed to you, right? You are held accountable for those sins. Yes, but I don't see how that pertains to the so, doctrine of well, eternal I'm, I'm security. Asking you, well, I'm asking you as you look at Romans 4, 8, when it says, blesses the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Mm -hmm. How does that work if every sin you can commit is imputed to you? You're assuming that what it means is that when someone is justified by God, sins will never be imputed to them, will never destroy charity in their heart any onward in the future. Which, as I said before, I don't see how you're reading of this, that, well, blesses the man, his sins will never, it doesn't say they will never be imputed to them. What does ume mean? What does ume mean? Yes. Isn't that a strong negative? It means will, um, will ume not. Ume la tai. That's the strongest way of saying will not be imputed. So... You, 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 said, you said, well, I'm, I'm, that, 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 by the way, is not my, my reading of, of the text. As I read this, mm -hmm. the blessedness, verse 9, uh, of forgiveness of sin is his by faith before he is circumcised, which is his argument against the Jews. Mm -hmm. But his point is, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, and that's the explanation of what crediting righteousness the, the, apart from works. The reason, so the how reason, am I not read, What is the positive reading on your part well, the, of verse 8? The, the two point here, the reason the sins will... So White is pressing horn on his exegesis, and this is what you must do. Okay, it's not just that someone gets to say, oh, you're wrong about your interpretation, or even, well, here's my interpretation, right? The bottom line is, more work needs to be done in order to prove interpretations. And so White wants Horn to exegete the text, probably starting from like, verse 6 and then going down. But the issue is very similar to Hebrews. If you isolate the verse without paying attention to what is being discussed before and after it, then you probably are going to agree with Horn. Okay, but if you start looking around and you notice the way that the Apostle Paul is talking about justification and, and the, the free gift of salvation in the book of Romans, uh, and you notice that Paul's not talking anywhere about it being conditional to future works, well, then you're probably going to agree with White here. <laughs> Are you starting to see why folks can't seem to agree on this? That I think the distinction you're trying to draw, so I'll, I'll make two points, a smaller point and a larger point. The smaller point being is I think you're trying to set up a dichotomy here and saying, well, Catholics believe in infusion of righteousness, and Romans 4a teaches imputation, and so clearly since you, you, know, you don't believe in that, this contradicts your, your theology. No, we, we believe that, you know, righteousness of God can be imputed to us. I just said it can't be a legal fiction. Uh, and what I said in the passage, blessed is the man that the sin will not be taken into account is because he's confessed. Going back to Psalm 32, it's talking about seeking forgiveness from God, like when King David sought forgiveness from Bathsheba. So that's the smaller point. But you, I mean, you and I can debate justification, you know, un, until I, the, the, the metaphor escapes me, I guess, until the cows come home and someone credits them to our farm or whatever. We could debate justification however long you want, but 
you could believe in justification by faith alone and imputed righteousness, but it wouldn't follow from that that you have eternal security because people like Martin Luther or Wesley or others believe that if faith leaves, if you commit apostasy, then you lose your justification. That legal decree is legally reversed. And I haven't really... So Horn's making a good point from his position here, okay? Technically, just looking at Romans 4.8 uh, in this little space, you cannot completely dismiss the notion that conditional security is false because there's technically no explicit statement that inveighs against that. You, you, you could make the argument, and, and White is probably he would do this, that if God does not impute sin, then that applies not only at the point of salvation, but it also applies moving forward into the Christian's walk with God. But that's probably an inference based on other places in the scripture, not here in Romans 4.8. So Horn is bringing up a point that I would probably bring up if I were in his position. I've really seen any evidence to show God would not do that, even if the Protestant theory of justification is true. You said in John chapter 6, verse 37, um, that you, you, you introduced the term conditionally, uh, and, but then you seem to stop and say, well, actually, that's later on. So I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't certain what you were saying. I, you? I, I was referring to, because I, I thought that we might go talk a little bit more about John 640 or John 644, which talk about how the person who is believing on Jesus, who is coming to Jesus, uh, that he will be raised up. That, as you say in your own book, the promise is that it, it's conditional. That did I ever say it was conditional? No, I, I'm saying it's the natural progression of that. If the father draws someone to the son, the father draws, they'll come to the son, and those who keep on coming, who keep on believing, they will be raised up to life. Because there's nothing in the text that says the drawing is some kind of irresistible grace that forces people to always, that, that means they will always come to the sun. I, okay. I don't see that. So, so let me, well, you say you don't see it, but I'll, let me try to help you see it. Uh, and we, we'll pray that you'll see it. Um, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Which, which action comes first? Uh, the giving of the Father or the coming to the Son? In the text it says that the Father gives all, which is the whole body of the body of believers. Okay. So the Father gives the body believers, and they come. And so, so which, is, do you believe that the text is indicating a relationship between these actions? Between the Father giving, giving and, and our coming. Yeah, I would say so, that anyone, we, you can't approach the Son unless you're, you're drawn or given by the Father. That's the necessity of grace. Is sure. that everybody? Is everyone given by the Father to the Son? Is every... Every, every human being? Every human being. Yeah is given by the Father to the Son. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, in other words, isn't this a specific people? Well, yeah. What F.F. What Bruce says in his commentary on, on the Gospel of John, he says that this is the neuter singular. This is so good. I, I really do like that Horn brings up theologians. Well, I don't know about F.F. Bruce, but he's been the whole entire debate bringing up theologians who are in agreement or support his particular position, but they are not Catholic. You know, this is very, very good. This is a really good strategy. It'd be the equivalent of somebody going into a debate with an atheist and bringing up a lot of atheists and quoting them to support their Christian position. Uh, that that's I, I like that Horn's been doing that. That's that's really great. He's talking about how that this is the whole body of believers, of believers who are given. And so, you know, if you, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to come to him. So the believers are given, they come to Jesus, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. But okay. it doesn't... I'm, I'm confused, But you have, to, you have to come to Jesus. Didn't you just conflate believing and coming? Aren't they the same thing? They're the same thing, aren't they? You can't come to Jesus without believing in him, right? Well, our life with Christ is... What it looks like White is doing is trying to identify where Horn's view fits into Jesus' words here. Again, if you're not keeping up with this, you need to go back and take a look at these passages of Scripture, okay? Jesus says, John 6, all that the Father gives me will come. But if Horn has conflated coming with believing, then what he's saying is Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will believe. That's what White is trying to tease out right at this particular moment. What this has to do with eternal security is not at all clear. 
Uh, unless White is setting Horn up for something later. I mean, we'll just have to see about that. I know you disparaged obedience earlier, but Romans 1.5 says that we have to practice the obedience of faith. I never faith. disparaged obedience. Well, you, you said as if obedience wasn't something a part of maintaining our inheritance in the kingdom of God. As if, you I know, said it wasn't the basis upon which we earn it, but that's, that's a different issue. I, I want to stick with John 6.37. In John 6, believing and coming are parallel, are they not? Okay, fine. Yeah, those, those who believe will come to Jesus, it, but it doesn't say that they're always going to come to Jesus or they can't ever leave. Okay, so, but I, I'm just confused here because it sounded like in your mind, you said God gives the ones who are believing in Jesus. The order in the text is we believe in Jesus because God gave us. Well, okay, it's the there it all, is. all that the Father gives me. What, yeah. is, what is that all that's being given? I, I, what makes the most sense? It's the body of the believers, or the, I guess you could say the body of people who will come to believe. I don't think that changes the argument at all. Those who are given by the Father to the Son will come to the Son, and the one who comes, the one who continues to come, will not be cast out. But if someone stops coming, Jesus may not cast them out. Look. It so now Horn is basically on the receiving end of his own argument about Romans 4, right? Uh, in John 6, 37, there is technically no explicit statement that includes all of what Horn just characterized. Not in that verse. You have to infer what Horn just said based on other places in the scripture. So, <laughs> so at this point, this is like the end of every Rocky movie. You know, Rocky gives a punch and then he takes a punch, right? And then, you know, I, I mean, this is this is uh, this is a really good debate. I don't know who you think Rocky is in this particular debate. But you can't deny that Horn's got a little eye of the tiger thing going on over here. You know what I mean? Yeah, hey, uh, you know, uh, you know what you want. By the way, that is my favorite moment in Rocky Three. It's when Mr. T is taunting Rocky, and he starts talking to Adrian, and he's like, "Hey there, Mama, I bet you lay awake at night dreaming about a real man." You know, and then and then Rocky just stares at him from like the crowd, and you think he's gonna get angry or something. The only thing he says is, uh, "You know, you got a big mouth. You know that." <laughs> If I'm at the, if I say to you, if you come to the debate table uh, after the debate to talk to me, I won't cast you out. It doesn't mean you can't leave on your own accord. So, I, but, so I don't see Trent, eternal security. Trent, can't you can't you see that the the very verse before verse 37 says, "But I said to you that you have seen me, and you are not believing." He's explaining the unbelief of these individuals, and he explains it on the basis that you have to be given by the Father. Right. Well, to the son, they, they to believe, right? They, not because they were not. Believe. I to clarify, in order to believe, faith is a gift that must be given. A person cannot have faith uh, on their on their own merits or initiative. You have to receive the gift of faith. But it doesn't follow from that that if someone receives the gift of faith from God, that they will not throw away that gift later. And so I, I don't think that you've shown John six thirty seven so, proves okay, eternal that's security. Our time. And that's what you need to say from Horn's position. Uh, you, you know, this is an interesting verse, Dr. White, but it doesn't show eternal security. It, it might support unconditional election, but it doesn't technically tell us about eternal security. That's exactly how you need to handle this. Let's talk a little bit about Galatians 5.4. Yeah. You, you gave a interesting illustration, uh, one of someone who straddles two roads and you can't go down the road of grace and the road of law mm. indefinitely. You're going to pick one or the other. If someone is on the road of grace, doesn't that mean God gave them grace and they are part of the elect? The specific statement says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. That's, that's the context. That's, that's verse 2. Mm. That has to be understood before this. So he is addressing individuals who would be willing to add to faith in Christ, human activity, human accomplishment, entering into the old covenant, whatever else it might be. People who would add to the work of Christ, so… These are people who are claiming to be Christians. They're, they're claiming to be Christians, and then they want to do something where… But they're, but they're not Christians. Well, if they will accept circumcision then they have not understood what the gospel is. So That's they true. haven't been given the grace God gives someone to know circumcision is not the route you're supposed to go. They are in danger of being deceived by these individuals, yes. And Paul is extremely concerned but about it. 
there were people in Paul's time who would have been tempted to become Judaizers. Did they stop? Did they not become Judaizers because of their merit? Or did God give them grace so they would not become Judaizers? God would have protected his elect people because they're his sheep and he will lose none of his sheep uh, from their entering into. They could have entered in temporarily to error, mm -hmm. but they but not would not be lost. Not but they would not be lost in, I'm sorry? But they wouldn't do it permanently. No. Okay, so. In fact, I think we would probably agree given your perseverance. Yeah, somebody, as thing. Jesus says, the person who doesn't endure to the end will not be saved. Yes. Matthew 10, 22, I, I agree with that. So, but the, the problem here is, you're saying, well, they're, 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 they're not Christians. Um, well, I'm so saying, so, no, I'm, what I'm saying is they're in danger of, of accepting non-Christian teaching. Because if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage. You can claim Jesus all you want. But if you, you do not accept him as he is in the way that God has ordained, that is not going to, that is not the gospel. And Our, so I want to be warned against false gospels because that's what the, the book started off by warning me against. I don't want to be anathema. So if a Christian in Paul's church accepts circumcision temporarily and then returns, has he through that process fallen from grace? Well. It says in verse four, you are severed from Christ. This is a really great exchange. Uh, and I'm just sitting here, you know, kind of stepping outside the scope of this video. I'm zooming out and just admiring the back and forth. These guys are doing exactly what they should be doing from their positions. This is what great cross exam can look like. You know, if, if I were whites or horns old debate coaches, I'd be very proud of these guys. I guess you're saying that there's somebody who can uh, temporarily uh, Exact circumcision. It seems I, to me. I have known people who have gone into error and who have been delivered from the errors of their ways. Yes. So they fell from grace. They they would have moved away from the. They, they they've no longer had access to God's grace. But if they're of God's sheep, he's he's going to keep them. So okay, but, but that's that, not being. But that's the here. point then, because if it's only temporary. I, I didn't answer your question because I, I I I rhetorically asked a question I shouldn't have done that. Let me non rhetorically answer your question. I read verse 4, and then I stopped, and I said, who? You have been severed from Christ, who? You who are seeking to be justified by law. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this, is a, this is a person who is seeking to be justified by law. The, the redeemed are not going to be seeking that. So this is an unredeemed person who was severed from Christ and fell from grace. Anyone who seeks to be justified by law will not find Christ to be of benefit to them. In that situation, in that day, could there have been people that when they first read the, the book of Galatians in the congregation were torn between the authority of the Apostle Paul and the false teachers that they liked so very well? That's not even what's being addressed. What Paul is saying, there is not two ways Did of salvation. Did you say this is an unredeemed person he's talking about? The, the one who is seeking to be justified yes. by law? Yes. So they don't have grace. If they're seeking to be justified by law, they don't understand the gospel. Then how do you fall from grace if you never had it in the first because, place? Because you are moving it away is. from the sphere where that could even be an area of action in your life. It's, you, are, you are assuming all through this, and I haven't really challenged it as yet because I, I, it, it's sort of part of another uh, debate, but you are, you are viewing grace as a substance something that can be merited, the saris meritorum, the grace that is in it, so on and so forth. I, I would challenge that concept of grace as ever even entering into the mind of the apostle or entering into the mind of any of the New Testament writers. Could I be thinking of grace as the favor of God that you could do something to fall from, as Paul says in Galatians 5, 4, that when the no. word ekpipto is used to fall, is it ever used in another place to describe someone who is just never united or attached to something in the first place? Doesn't it talk the about chains falling off or flower severing, petals falling? Severing and falling is showing a complete disjunction. The way of faith is of grace. The way of law is not. Paul's already established these categories earlier in Galatians. So here we find another question of, of exegesis where you need to know your scripture, okay? But the bottom line is, I think... Horn has less work to do to support his position in Galatians 5 
than white does. In other words, white has a greater hill to climb in terms of interpretation that fits into his particular contention. There is no question that the Apostle Paul is speaking in a rhetorical fashion to warn the church not to be taken with false teaching. I mean, some of the strongest language that you've ever seen the Apostle Paul use, if you just go to Galatians 3, 1, right? Like, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, right? But what is in question is how to understand his rhetoric. Is the Apostle Paul talking about losing your salvation, or is he merely providing a forceful contrast between the way of Christ and the way of the law, which, which by the way, Paul speaks of grace in Christ synonymously. So the only way you're going to be able to answer this question, in my opinion, is by making an inference based on other parts of the scripture as well. You, you have to make a cumulative case from various passages. You cannot tack your whole answer on this topic to one verse in the Bible. Okay, are, are you beginning to see the issue at play here? Because there, there is no one verse that clearly spells this out for you. All right, multiple places of scripture must come together to provide a framework for you to understand this topic. And that's why both Horn and White are having to do a lot of work to justify themselves in cross-examination. Because when you zoom in on one verse, it doesn't go the full distance by itself to support one side or the other. And if you're going down this direction, you're not going that direction. That's the, the, the you so, can't so go the, both directions. Just to summarize before we move on, to fall from grace doesn't mean you're on this path to grace and you go down here to law. It just means you were never here in the first place and you've always been doing this. No, I simply say, the, the verse four says, if you are seeking to be justified by law, this is the only people this is descriptive of. The only people it's descriptive of. And they need to understand they're trying to meld, and this is an area where I think Rome does this, they are trying to meld grace and works. And Paul's point is these two things are completely disjuncted. They cannot be put together. Okay, so, so you would say then, then one last question then about the understanding of the meaning of the passage. Would you at least agree uh, an ordinary person when they read something like fell from grace means a person had grace, now they no longer have it. If you're uh, and, and let me finish. And uh, an ordinary person or even a learned person like Martin Luther, it would be understandable why they might come to a conclusion like if that. If your ordinary person wasn't, you know, and, and when you keep quoting Martin Luther, what He's time, kind of a big deal around what here. What time in Martin Luther's life? Because that changed over time. If you're familiar with the difference between Martin Luther before 1525, after 1525, to about 1535, is, and then after is that, there, a there are different in, periods. Is, so there a writing in Luther? is there a writing in Luther where he affirms the position you're defending tonight? I believe it would be consistent with what he writes prior to 1525. After that point, I mean, is in light in light of his in light of his debate with Erasmus, and before the influence of Melanchthon. But let let, let me at least finish what we're saying in, in Galatians chapter five because we're getting into something else there. But the point of Galatians chapter five is this comes after the establishment of these categories of grace and works that the rest of the entire book is about. And I don't think you're allowing those categories to be to be indicative of what is being said right here. That's right? exactly correct. That's exactly. This is what I would say if I were in White's position. You cannot look at a verse in isolation without considering prior statements that help to contextually shape the verse in question. I think I'm just reading them the way anybody here or a pretty famous German guy from 500 years ago would read them. So why don't we move on to Romans. How about Romans 11.22? Uh, I think that's very interesting because you talked a lot. You know, We were talking about Romans 4.8. I think it made clear, even if you have a Protestant uh, theory of justification, that's a side issue to what we're debating tonight, it doesn't show eternal security, that Paul even says at the end of Romans, in Romans 11.22, if you don't continue in God's kindness, mm. you too will be cut off. So the first question is, wouldn't an ordinary person take the, not you, <laughs> wouldn't just an ordinary person take the plain meaning of this text to be, you can be in God's kindness, but then leave that state and be cut off. If they ignore the context, an ordinary person could make that error. But if you read Romans chapter 11, it's talking specifically here to the Gentiles and warning them against boasting against the Jews who have been hardened for this particular period of time and cut off. 
and therefore they are not to boast against them because there is a purpose why God has hardened are them. Are you at saying this point that you are the you are individual Gentiles? The you are the Gentile people as a whole. Well, it's a, it's a singular it's a singular you. Paul's addressing but a hypothetical but a, person. It, does, it doesn't matter if it's singular because a singular can be used of an individual representing a no, group. No, I, I agree with that. So then we can talk about the group. Then he's talking about the Gentiles. Are they Gentile believers or unbelievers? They're Gentile believers. So Gentile believers can be cut off from God's Gentile kindness? believers need to be warned not to boast against the branches. What will happen if they do that? The individuals, again, all the warning passages are given to us by God's grace to tell us this is what God wants us to do, this is what God does what not happens, want us to and do. And what happens if we don't do And that? when they start doing that, the question then becomes, do we look at this as, well, Okay, if Gentiles, if there's ever been anyone in the history of the church that has an anti-Jewish perspective, as the papacy did for hundreds of years, in a, in a horrible sense, how is that uh, then relevant? That means, to what then that means about, that James. they've been cut off. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, Time? yeah. I mean, the papacy—they right? they should model Luther when it comes to talking about Thank the Jews. Thank you, folks. Well, no, no, we no have question about it. Spicy, little little spicy there at the end. Uh, look, at the end of the day, Horn did a great job questioning White about passages that do not appear to support White's contention, and White did a great job uh, questioning Horn about passages that don't appear to support Horn's contention. And in my opinion, they both answered the way that they should. So, in terms of style and substance, they are pretty evenly matched here. Like I said, it's so evenly matched on both sides here, it really comes down to who won by inches. You, you know what I mean? Like, who won by a nose? And so for me, it comes down to not so much their successes, because I think both Horn and White were successful in engaging the topic question. Uh, their opening statements and rebuttals were very solid. Uh, I think they both laid a great framework for the audience to navigate this kind of discussion. Although, you could make the argument that that in this kind of more informal structure, they could have done a little bit more of laying a framework during cross exam, so the audience can kind of keep up with the specific scriptural discussions. They they did a little, but you know that's anyway. Um, they even did a great job of handling the word because, as I said, there is no one verse that clearly and definitively teaches eternal security. I mean, maybe the closest you can get to that would be like John six or John chapter ten. You know what I mean? But even then, Horn had a response for that. So for me, it doesn't come down to how well they did, but where they misstepped. And while both gentlemen did make a couple of missteps, in my opinion, Horn took a big one right at the beginning of first cross-exam when he basically agreed with White's own contention that some do not fall away. That's not a small deal, friends. That's kind of sort of conceding the other side's position, which you should not do in a debate like this. All right, White never had that kind of moment when he was in the hot seat, and so I think this tips the scale in favor of White. I think White uh, took this debate, but again, it was very, very close. And that's the thing too, like, you probably watching this debate, maybe you think the scale tipped in favor of Horn, but this is what I love to see. Two gentlemen, very good at what they do, bringing out the clash, engaging from their perspectives, tackling the scriptures. I mean, this debate was a very good one to watch. Thanks very much for watching this video. Again, if you have any ideas for me to uh, watch any future apologetics debates, like maybe the one that just dropped on Unbelievable, then definitely let me know. We vote on these um, every other week, so stay in touch with my community tab on the channel, and uh, you'll get to vote and tell me which one you want me to do in the future. If you disagree with me on uh, anything that you saw in this video, I mean, let me know in the comments below, but let's, let's try to be very careful the way that the two interlocutors were. Uh, and uh, support ourselves if we're going to have that kind of a discussion. But for now, I'm going to take a break, and I will return soon with more videos. And in the meantime, I'll say bye for now. Yeah.